Okay, so I see that a lot of people have already joined, so I think we can we can get started. Um, I'm Eli Coaz, Communications Director, and thank you everybody for joining uh, this uh, emergency video call about the latest escalation um, in Gaza that seems to be coming to an end. Uh, if anybody uh, ha wants to ask a question, there's a Q&A option uh, that people will see at the bottom of their screen, those people that are logged in on, uh, on the via video. Um, the other option is to click uh, raise hand and then uh, at the end of the call, uh, we'll be calling on questions and I'll uh, be able to, to put you on uh, broadcast and uh, you'll be able to ask your question. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn the call over to Israel Policy Forum's board chair, uh, Susie Gelman. Susie. Thank you, Ellie. And thank you everyone for joining today's discussion with Neri Zilber on such short notice. Uh, in recent months, Israel Policy Forum has been convening private and public conversations around the country on the situation in Gaza, recognizing that too often we find ourselves only discussing Gaza at times like these. It's important that those of us who seek a more peaceful future between Israelis and Palestinians talk about and begin to understand the challenges in Gaza as well as possible solutions. As we indicated in our organization statement that was published uh, this weekend after Shabbat, we unequivocally condemn the rocket fire from the Gaza Strip. We also recognize that without a more sustainable political arrangement and without addressing humanitarian conditions in Gaza, these kinds of escalations are likely to repeat themselves. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Coplow, our policy director, who will lead the discussion. And Neri, again, thank you so much for joining us really very uh, on very short notice. And thank you everyone for participating in today's call. Thank you, Susie. So uh, hi, everyone. I am delighted to be joined by uh, our, our friend Neri Zilber, uh, who is an adjunct fellow at the Washington Institute and a journalist uh, whose work you can find at the Daily Beast, Foreign Policy, and plenty of other places. Uh, and Neri is one of the uh, expert journalists who is working on Gaza. So um, Neri, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And uh, why don't we kick things off by, um, you know, give us a sense of how, how we got to this round of fighting that uh, seems to have, have, have ended. Um, but how did we get to this round of fighting over the weekend? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, big fan of the organization, uh, as you all know. Uh, so, right, I mean, we just concluded uh, early this morning, uh, so it's early Monday morning Israel time, uh, two, two full days of uh, fighting uh, between Israel and Gaza, between the IDF and Hamas and other Palestinian militant factions inside the Strip. Uh, really the worst violence uh, we've seen since the 2014 war uh, between Israel and, and Gaza. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind, and we'll probably get into that in a little bit. Uh, how we got here? Uh, you know, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's, it's always a question of where, you know, how far back you want to go. Uh, so I'll take you back uh, one week, one month, and then one year, right? So a year ago, uh, March, end of March 2018, uh, we started to see these, uh, you know, border marches, riots, demonstrations, whatever you want to call it, uh, on the Israel-Gaza border, uh, really instigated and coordinated and controlled by Hamas. And the real goal uh, with these marches uh, was to create uh, friction, was to create violence uh, in order to extract from Israel uh, economic, financial, humanitarian concessions, uh, what, what Hamas and other uh, Palestinian factions called breaking the siege uh, around Gaza. That's been in place really since 2007, uh, since Hamas uh, seized control of the Gaza Strip. So really starting from March 2018, uh, almost every month and a half or so, we've seen these escalations, uh, what they call rounds of fighting. Uh, between between the IDF and then Hamas and other militant factions. Uh, and really, it's almost like clockwork. Uh, every month and a half, you see an escalation. And this has been like this now for, for a year. Uh, and I should mention that every, every round almost, you've seen Hamas kind of pushing the envelope. Uh, you've seen them uh, increasing uh, rocket fire, uh, whether actual rockets or just rocket ranges. And uh, there's, a, there's a method to the madness. And again, it's to extract uh, economic and financial concessions from Israel. So a month ago, uh, another round of uh, fighting ensued, and everyone obviously uh, was, was alarmed, as they should be. Uh, 
war clouds gathering around Israel and Gaza. The big difference this time is that it was a few days before uh, the Israeli election on April 9th. And so as, as it has been the case over the past year, in every one of these rounds, uh, Egyptian mediators, uh, the UN envoy here on the ground, as well as the Qatari envoy, uh, rushed in and brokered an agreement between, between Israel and, and Hamas. And this was uh, a few days before the election, uh, a month ago. Now, we don't quite know uh, what Netanyahu promised, uh, but I think it was substantial because uh, at the end of March, really, there was, uh, there was a kind of inflection point where it was a year to the border marches and you had an Israeli election coming up, uh, but Hamas uh, tamped down the violence and I was on the border uh, on the day. Uh, really, it was like clockwork. Uh, Hamas had its people out uh, on the border, uh, stopping demonstrators and rioters and militants from from getting near the border. Uh, not one balloon was, uh, incendiary balloon was launched. Uh, not one rocket was launched. And so we passed that uh, quietly and successfully. Uh, last week, uh, I'll spare you the details, but really last week we saw an escalation. Uh, there was a long range rocket fired that uh, hit off the coast of Israel. Uh, that sparked an IDF response. Uh, on Friday, there was a sniper fire that hit uh, two IDF soldiers. And then Saturday morning, this past Saturday morning, we saw just a wholesale escalation by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, rocket fire onto Israel. Uh, and, and that kind of kicked things off. And, and we saw two days of fighting. And once again, uh, the Egyptians and the UN and the Qatari stepped in and brokered a ceasefire. So that's big picture what, you know, how we got here and what we just saw. Uh, but it, you know, not to belabor the point, these, these are negotiations by Hamas via rocket fire. Uh, they're trying to negotiate and calibrate the level of violence uh, against Israel and against Israeli civilians uh, to extract concessions uh, from Israel. And uh, the, to the best of our knowledge, uh, the agreement that was reached a month ago wasn't quite upheld. Uh, there are various narratives as to why that was the case, uh, but Hamas, from its point of view, uh, didn't think that the various parties that were that were staked uh, to this previous agreement uh, were upholding their end of the bargain, and so it decided to escalate into this uh, this larger uh, confrontation. Uh, again, the worst we've seen since the 2014 war. Uh, the calendar actually helped them in this regard. Uh, Hamas uh, likely knew that uh, both uh, Memorial and Independence Day uh, for Israel was coming up uh, Wednesday and Thursday of this week. And more importantly, uh, starting March 14th, uh, it was a Eurovision uh, International Song Competition. Now, I'm, uh, you know, I don't know too much about it. Uh, I don't know if too many Americans know all that much about it, but, but it's a big deal in Europe, and it's an even bigger deal uh, here in Israel, uh, not because everyone is a huge fan of the competition, but it's a massive international uh, event. Uh, Israel has spent a year uh, uh, preparing for it. Uh, it's in the news now, preparations almost on a nightly basis. Uh, they've poured millions of dollars into, into infrastructure for the competition. Uh, tens of thousands of tourists are expected to, to fly in. So that was a big deal. And obviously, uh, one Hamas rocket uh, onto Tel Aviv could have really uh, undone all of it. Uh, could have been canceled uh, and worse. So, so Hamas likely knew that Netanyahu wasn't going to run that risk and that uh, the chances were high that uh, the, the negotiators would once again uh, come in, broker a deal, uh, perhaps on better terms, we'll get into it in a minute, and uh, the fighting would stop, and that's, that's what happened. So there, you know, as you point out, this was the, the worst round since 2014, um, and obviously, you know, one of the, as, you, as you've already mentioned, one of the circumstances here that um, is perhaps unique is the timing in terms of Yom HaZikar and Yom HaTzmaut, but more importantly, Eurovision. Uh, is there anything else different that's, that was driving it this time in terms of, you know, timing, personalities, change circumstances, uh, or is this just kind of fluky that this was the, the most sustained or um, really the most, um, the largest round since 2014? Uh, not, not fluky. I mean, the calendar, I think, played a big role in this, uh, as did the fact that I think uh, from, from the perspective of the Gaza Strip, uh, Israel and maybe other parties weren't upholding their end of the bargain um, for an agreement that was reached a month ago, again, under very uh, tight circumstances in terms of 
in terms of Israeli politics and the considerations uh, here. Uh, another thing driving, driving the conflict really was the level of violence uh, this time. So if, if these various rounds every month and a half for the past year seem like Groundhog Day, um, and in many respects it is, uh, same, same rhetoric coming out of both sides, uh, you know, same envoys uh, coming in, uh, this time was quite different uh, in the level of violence deployed by, deployed by both parties, by both sides. So the IDF really, uh, really was a lot more aggressive. I think that uh, has a lot to do with the new IDF chief of staff, uh, Abib Kohavi. Uh, I think he's, he's known as perhaps more, more aggressive, some would say more creative. There are other adjectives that you might want to use uh, in comparison to his predecessor, uh, Dadi Eisenkot, which is um, you know, considered a great chief of staff, but perhaps a bit more, a bit more cautious. Uh, so that was one thing on the Israeli side, and you saw a, a more forceful response even starting last week uh, to the long-range rocket that I mentioned uh, that was fired uh, to various other provocations on the border that has its own uh, kind of escalatory dynamic. Uh, and then also on the, on the Palestinian side in, from Gaza, you saw them really uh, uh, both in the quantity of rocket fire and also the, the rate of rocket fire uh, really unprecedented. And I think it speaks to to their uh, ability to uh, command and control uh, their forces. Uh, they also deployed anti-tank uh, missiles that uh, tragically cost the life of one Israeli civilian uh, near the Gaza border. Uh, also uh, almost unprecedented, uh, kind of a, a different weapon that they, that they rarely deploy. Um, so the level of violence was a lot higher and, and for Israel really, uh, four civilians were killed uh, by rocket fire. The first Israeli civilians killed since uh, by rocket fire since 2014, and uh, and so we know that 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 also played a part because uh, obviously Netanyahu and the IDF uh, their their response was a lot more a lot more aggressive uh, because of that and understandably so. So um, a ceasefire has reportedly been agreed to uh, mediated by the Egyptians as of early this morning. So what, what's in the ceasefire and is it any different from the last one? And, and do you have any expectation that it will hold any better? So it's, it's essentially the same agreement that they have. Uh, you know, I can get into the, the various uh, things that, that Hamas uh, ostensibly got. And again, we're going on reports and sources from the Palestinian side. Uh, the Israeli government for its part uh, doesn't even acknowledge there is a ceasefire, um, absurdly enough. Uh, that's that's a whole other issue in terms of in terms of its own rhetoric and its own messaging. Uh, but but the deal is the same deal uh, that they reached uh, a month ago, and it's the same deal that's really been on the table uh, since late late uh, last year. Uh, so you have obviously uh, Qatari cash uh, being moved into the Gaza Strip. Uh, you have uh, fishing zones expanded. Uh, you have uh, the crossings opened up. You have uh, increasing uh, Say electricity generation, you have a cash for works program run by the UN, uh, and onwards and upwards uh, in terms of uh, what Hamas uh, wanted, what it felt it wasn't getting, and what ultimately Netanyahu, uh, we believe, uh, agreed to. Now, the one interesting wrinkle this time around is that according to, to our information, uh, there's a one week deadline for, for implementation. Uh, so ostensibly, this is a one-week deadline to see these things actually materialize. Uh, Hamas uh, argues that they, that they haven't so far, uh, but there's a one-week deadline, and that's not a coincidence because the Eurovision starts uh, next Tuesday. So if we take one week from from today, it's uh, basically the eve of Eurovision. So so I believe if we see progress on these various uh, files that are inside the ceasefire agreement, if, if Hamas and the Gaza people actually uh, see these things materialize and relief uh, come in, uh, especially now today is the first day of Ramadan. It's also uh, played a role as well. But if they see it materialize, then I think uh, it could hold. Uh, and if it doesn't materialize, then then the Eurovision might might be a risk. Uh, but uh, but I think Netanyahu doesn't want that to happen, and I think he'll he'll actually play ball despite the fact that he doesn't even acknowledge that he's that he's given these things to uh, to Hamas. Uh, and longer term, uh, it's, it's open to interpretation. Uh, I think the Israeli political uh, dynamic will play a role in this. Uh, I think most importantly is the figure of Avigdor Lieberman. Uh, so obviously Lieberman was the former defense minister 
Uh, he resigned in protest last November after one of these rounds of fighting. Uh, he thought Netanyahu and government policy was way too soft vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hamas and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, rockets and terror coming from Gaza. And so he resigned in protest. Uh, now he's, he's obviously a crucial coalition partner for, for the next Netanyahu government. Uh, he needs to come on board and, and Gaza, Gaza policy will be, will be a big ask from him, we believe. Uh, so that might cause Netanyahu to, to have to shift uh, policy, uh, obviously become a bit more, a bit more hawkish than he otherwise uh, uh, is inclined to be. And so, so that actually, I think, is the key, the key uh, let's say, dynamic or, or uh, unknown so far. Uh, and as we both know, to, to Netanyahu's credit, and this is uh, despite his international image as, as a hardliner, uh, Netanyahu doesn't, uh, doesn't like to, to enter conflict. He doesn't like to go to war. He's actually a lot more cautious and a lot more uh, pragmatic than he's uh, usually given credit for. Right, and, and something to, you know, to note that uh, Benny Gantz and Kakho Laban tried to hit him with uh, during the election campaign, but he was too cautious on, on Gaza. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, uh, just uh, as a quick kind of aside. Uh, so blue and white, uh, so there was, as I mentioned during the campaign, this, this large uh, round of fighting, this large escalation in Gaza. Uh, the rhetoric then was a lot more cautious, uh, a lot more uh, statesmanlike, uh, if you will. Uh, you, mean from initially... you mean from Kakhova? Right. They didn't quite use it as a, as a campaign issue, as an election issue. Uh, they said, you know, we don't like to criticize the government when, when rockets are falling and when shots are being fired. This time around, I think they might have learned their lesson, at least politically, and they've come out very, a lot more forcefully uh, in terms of their rhetoric. And they're, they're the ones actually calling for a full-on uh, offensive uh, against Hamas and Gaza. Right. And do you, do you see any, any chance of that happening? No, I mean, Netanyahu is, he just won re-election. Uh, he's in a strong position uh, politically, despite certain, you know, today was a bad day. Uh, he had a lot of uh, right-wing right -wing pundits and even one senior member of the Likud come out and, and criticize uh, the ceasefire. You know, Netanyahu can weather it, the new cycle will move on, but, uh, but really Lieberman uh, will, is, is, is the key figure because he needs Lieberman to, to form a, a government. Uh, to form a governing coalition. Uh, interestingly enough, Lieberman, Lieberman hasn't said a word. Uh, all throughout the last weekend, he hasn't said a word. Uh, that might be due to the fact that he's been on vacation in Cyprus all weekend. He just returned uh, today. It's the second vacation Lieberman has taken since election day, and that kind of tells you how, how he negotiates and bargains. Uh, it'll likely come down to the last minute uh, in terms of whether he, he actually agrees to, to be in the next Netanyahu government. Um, there's been a, a lot of speculation that there is a split between Hamas and Islamic Jihad, um, that Iran, which is Islamic Jihad's, um, I was going to say primary, but really sole sponsor, um, you know, drove this by, uh, by giving directions to Islamic Jihad and that Hamas was, was dragged into it. What's, what's your view of that? So, right, this is a line we've been hearing uh, not just from the government, but I heard it uh, directly from, from senior uh, security figures here uh, in the last few days. I, uh, I have an issue with, <laughs> with, that, with that narrative uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, it's been very fashionable uh, to, hear, to hear the analysis point fingers at everybody but Hamas uh, in terms of these various escalations. And we've seen it, uh, by the way, since late last year. Uh, sometimes it's it, they blame the weather for air and rocket fire on Israel. Sometimes it's uh, it's the proverbial Hamas intern who pressed the wrong button on the espresso machine. I'm, I'm joking, but not not uh, that greatly. Uh, and and this time uh, the finger was pointed at uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who's actually the faction who fired the long range rocket a week ago that landed uh, off the coast of Israel and this kind of started this this really this last round. Now. Uh, the notion is, and this is, this is almost verbatim, that, that uh, Hamas was dragged into this round of conflict, uh, that it deterred from acting against Islamic Jihad in Gaza, and that really Islamic Jihad at the behest of Iran is trying to torpedo uh, these ceasefire talks and these ceasefire understandings. Now, if that were true, uh, I don't believe Hamas would have joined in immediately uh, in, in coordinated fashion with Islamic Jihad uh, this past Saturday morning and kind of escalated into a wider uh, and longer conflict. Uh, we've seen Hamas and other factions 
uh, do a very good job in the past of command and control of their fire, uh, not just actually firing rockets, but the range. We saw that this past time as well. Uh, if, if somebody really wanted to torpedo uh, these understandings and really, really cause an escalation, if not a war, uh, they would have fired on Tel Aviv, for instance. Uh, that didn't happen at all. It was actually quite, quite well coordinated. Uh, and, and even more importantly, there was a, when the ceasefire took hold uh, early this morning, uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad leaders were sitting around the same conference table uh, in Cairo. Now, uh, if they were really trying to torpedo the talks uh, they, you know, and, and play the spoiler, uh, they might have perhaps agreed to, to the ceasefire in Cairo, but, uh, but how, did, how could anybody know that they wouldn't uh, have backtracked on that? Uh, and really, we saw the, the IDF home front this morning almost immediately uh, go back to normal. Uh, they lifted all the restrictions that had been in place in southern Israel uh, and, and almost immediately. And, and if they were really concerned about somebody uh, undermining these, these talks, uh, I don't believe they would have been as, uh, as uh, let's say, uh, carefree with, uh, with lifting those restrictions on, on the civilians in the south. And I think most importantly, there, there's a joint command and command room for Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza where they run these campaigns. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that, uh, that uh, Hamas doesn't know what Islamic Jihad is doing. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that, that this kind of joint effort, this joint militant effort coming out of Gaza would have, would have been maintained. Uh, this is a huge strategic priority for uh, the, Gazan, uh, the Hamas leader in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar. He's been working on this for a year and a half. Uh, so I don't, I don't quite buy that narrative. Um, and I think, last point on this, um, you know, Islamic Jihad isn't disconnected from the wider Gazan population. Uh, they live in Gaza, their families live in Gaza. Uh, Gaza needs uh, economic and humanitarian relief. And I think it's, it's arguably uh, an interest of Islamic Jihad and its cadres to, uh, to have that materialize. Um, they might, I'd say this hypothetically, but I actually believe it, they might be a useful boogeyman for all parties involved uh, to provide some plausible deniability uh, with Hamas and the Netanyahu government, uh, kind of point the finger at someone else and to continue negotiating indirectly uh, amongst themselves. Okay, so uh, we have a, a number of questions piling up here. Uh, and as a reminder, to ask a question, you can either type it in the Q&A box or you can uh, signal to, to raise your hand. Um, and I'll, I'll take these as, as, as they come in. Um, so first, uh, we have a question from Alan Minton. Um, he says, the current situation is clearly unsustainable. Uh, do you have recommendations for alleviation? Well, I know uh, IPF and other uh, uh, esteemed think tanks in, in Washington and other places have put forward, uh, I think, more kind of long-term sustainable solutions uh, for the problem of Gaza. Um, you know, look, uh, the, the real crux of the matter is that, uh, that Hamas and the other factions want a lifting of the siege, and Israel, uh, the Israeli government, and the various security arms are loath to do that because Hamas uh, uses uh, uses that, that reprieve to rearm and strengthen itself. Uh, so a full opening of, of the Gaza Strip, uh, I think, would be a heavy lift, especially in the current Israeli political climate. I think currently the best we can hope for is, is for the ceasefire understandings to actually go, go forward, um, to really stabilize the situation to the, to the greatest extent possible uh, via the UN, uh, via Qatari cash, and really uh, everything from, from increased uh, medical aid to increased uh, fuel and electricity and water and sanitation and, and work, uh, you know, cash for work programs and onwards, you know, on down the line, I think will, will help the matter. But ultimately you're, you're, you're dealing with a situation where uh, for political reasons, I believe, uh, it'll be very difficult to, to get to the second and even third stage of these, of these uh, what they call truce or armistice uh, talks that have been going on now for quite some time, uh, and to actually have Israel and Hamas, uh, Hamas cut a cut a real deal that will that will give Gaza perhaps everything it's looking for, and uh, and in turn provide Israel with security. Uh, it's still Hamas uh, running the Gaza Strip. All right. Next question from Avi Poster. Even if Hamas received access to the cash it wants, uh, from whom does it use cash to purchase weaponry and how do these weapons get to them? If through the tunnels, aren't the Egyptians capable uh, of curtailing this more than they are? That's a great question. Um, 
So the Egyptians have cracked down on the tunnels uh, for a number of years now. Uh, some, some war material still comes through, but a lot of the arsenal is, uh, is homemade. They become adept at, at creating and uh, manufacturing their own, their own weapons, primarily, uh, primarily rockets. Uh, and I should say they've, they've fully rearmed. Uh, they fully rearmed since 2014. And that's something also to, uh, to keep in mind. They fired uh, almost 700 rockets uh, over the past two days. Uh, they have a lot more where that came from. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of money, so, so they obviously get some support from abroad. Uh, Qatar moves in money as well, has been for a few months now. Uh, but really, they, they, they kind of skim off the existing Gazan economy. They tax uh, the Gazan people and various Gazan businesses. Uh, goods that move into Gaza, especially via Egypt, are taxed heavily. And a lot of that money doesn't go to the welfare of the Gazan people, obviously. Uh, it goes to the, the Hamas uh, military wing. It goes to replenish their rocket arsenal. It goes to build uh, cross-border uh, attack tunnels. So again, uh, it goes back to the first question, right? Uh, you open up Gaza, you give them, you give them more relief, more money. Uh, what, what are they actually going to do with that? Okay. Uh, next question from Eric Winston: Is Israel's targeting Hamas's finance head a major escalation as well? So the, that particular figure, not in and of itself. Uh, you know, there's a debate about high, how high ranking he actually was. Uh, it's open to speculation. Uh, the fact that he wasn't uh, underground in a bunker, uh, fearing for his life during a, a massive military escalation, I think speaks to the fact that he he didn't think he was a target. Uh, so I don't know. You know, it's a good indication that that he might not have been that high ranking. Uh, on the flip side, uh, 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 Israeli journalist who I actually uh, greatly respect, uh, Channel 12's Oad Hemel, uh, actually was familiar with that figure. Uh, said he was an important figure in terms of moving money from Iran into Gaza for, for terrorist activities. So also something to keep in mind. Uh, I think the, the most important thing uh, stemming from that actual incident is the fact that Israel uh, restarted and targeted assassinations against, uh, against high value targets inside Gaza. And that was an indication, there was a signal to, to Hamas and Islamic Jihad that Israel was willing to escalate. Uh, whether that was true or not is, is again, open to speculation, but it was, it was a signal of intent. And, uh, and so, you know, if we were to see another round, then I, I, I have no doubt that, uh, that, that, that method, that tactic uh, will, be, will be repeated. Okay, uh, another question uh, from uh, an anonymous atten attendee, so I don't have a name. Uh, in my Twitter feed, I'm seeing many people citing that Israel shot dozens of unarmed Palestinian protesters in Gaza last Friday and killed four Palestinians including two protesters in Gaza before any projectiles were launched at Israel. One, is this true? And two, do you think this is an accurate reason for the barrage of missiles? So to take the first part of the question, there, there were two incidents, right? Uh, I didn't get into the details of, of the actual escalation dynamic, but there was an incident on the border where uh, we believe Islamic Jihad snipers um, fired on Israeli soldiers on the border. Uh, that in and of itself is, is fairly rare. Uh, they were injured, uh, but thankfully survived. Uh, so uh, Israel responded actually uh, and targeted a Hamas military post. Um, you know, it was a tactical response, uh, the IDF claims, and they killed a few uh, Hamas militants. So that was part of the, the, uh, the death count on the Gazan side on the day. I believe there was another casualty during the actual demonstrations, uh, somebody getting, uh, you know, rioting, marching too close, you can quibble about the terminology, but uh, but I think there was a casualty from that. Uh, and then the rocket barrage has actually started uh, after that, and the escalation started after that. Uh, and then the second part of the question, um, remind me? Uh, do you think this is an accurate reason for the no. barrage, meaning the, the deaths of the so, so that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, from Hamas's point of view, they, they lost uh, two of their guys and then that kicked off uh, the, the escalation that we saw ultimately over the weekend, uh, you know, again, if Hamas wanted to, it's, it's uh, absorbed worse than that. Uh, in the past, I think Hamas was looking uh, for a reason to, to escalate. Uh, the Islamic Jihad sniper fire on IDF forces uh, may have given them a reason. And, uh, you know, we've seen in the past, even 
even uh, during the worst of the Gaza border marches, where, where you know, dozens of, of Palestinians have been killed, uh, there was no rocket fire, uh, there was no real escalation to speak of. Uh, so it's, again, finally calibrated, and I don't think anything uh, is really left a chance. Okay, um, next from Jonah Nagy. If Israel takes an initiative to improve the humanitarian situation in Gaza, how might that impact the popularity of Hamas or lack thereof? Uh, I think it will greatly uh, improve the popularity of Hamas uh, because really that's, uh, that's what the population uh, needs and demands of, of the group ruling its lives now for, for 12 years. Uh, and really, uh, again, Sinwar, Yahya Sinwar, the, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, has, has staked uh, a lot on this working out that this kind of finely calibrated uh, increase and decrease of violence. Uh, negotiation via rocket will ultimately improve the situation uh, economically and, and financially and, and just, you know, socially in, in Gaza. And so if they can, if they can deliver on that, uh, that will improve their standing. Uh, we have to remember that about a month or two ago, there were almost unprecedented uh, demonstrations against Hamas inside Gaza uh, precisely because of the, the acute uh, difficulties inside the territory. Uh, now, bigger picture, I think, I think uh, this sends the exact wrong message uh, to, to various parties, but primarily to the Palestinian people. Um, you know, it shows that violence pays, A, and B, it shows that, that you reward violence um, and that you don't really uh, negotiate with the people who, who actually work with you in tandem uh, in, on security and, and on a you know, theoretical diplomatic track, which is uh, Abu Mas and, and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. So on the flip side, you have uh, Israel kind of responding to, to force, right? Israel only understands force. This is uh, what many people say. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, uh, it seems to be uh, somewhat anchored in truth because it's now negotiating with a terror group, albeit indirectly, but it is negotiating with Hamas um, because of this violence. Uh, and yet on the flip side in the West Bank, uh, you know, not only is it not negotiating with the Palestinian Authority, but it, things over there seem to be going um, in the opposite direction, uh, annexation and on down the line. So, uh, so it's a great question. And, and I think politically, uh, you know, there are a lot of good reasons to go for, for a truce, for an arrangement, as they call it here, with Hamas and Gaza, um, for nothing less than the welfare of the Gazan people and, and really the, the stability of the Gaza Strip. Um, but in tandem, I would argue, and I know, uh, IPF agrees. Uh, you have to you have to strike a uh, you know a diplomatic uh, path with the Palestinian Authority as well uh, to to kind of show that it's not just violence that Israel responds to. Yeah, um, we certainly we certainly agree with that. Um, from Dale Silver, what aspects of the previous agreement did Gazans think wasn't adequately implemented? Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the Qatari cash didn't come through. Uh, the Israeli government claims it was because of uh, Qatar and the UN and various bureaucratic issues. Uh, other people have a different reading of that, uh, but that's what the Israeli government uh, came out and said. Uh, but, but all sides agree that there was a delay in actually having the cash move into Gaza. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two, Israel. Oh, sorry, I'd, I'd, I'd interject there that um, according to a bunch of reports, the, the Qatari envoy has kind of ghosted everybody. <laughs> um, so. Right. Uh, um, so I'm not going to get into into my speculation as, as to why, but but yeah, he he kind of went MIA uh, until until I believe yesterday. Uh, you know, it's open to speculation as to as to why. Uh, but uh, you know, so the so what the cash. Can I do to convince you to speculate? Uh, all right. Uh, let me put it this way. There, there might've been reasons. There's a reason why I'm not, uh, obviously I'm a journalist and I, I would rather not kind of go on the record with, with my own theory and speculation, but there might be a reason outside of Israel and Gaza and Egypt, and let's say somewhere closer to where you guys are, uh, that might have, uh, angered the Qataris and maybe forced them to reconsider um, all that they're doing, all their largesse and support uh, to this Gaza project. Um, Got it. I can, I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, so nobody, nobody's actually quibbling as to, as to the fact that the money didn't come through. Now, last week, uh, Israel uh, cut back on the Gazan fishing zone in response to the, 
long range rocket that was fired. That was a big part of the agreement that actually was implemented uh, right before the election. The, the issue with the fuel, um, Israel, uh, I believe yesterday stopped the fuel. That was a card, they closed the crossings. That was also a card. Um, obviously those two things and others predate the, the escalation. Uh, but from Hamas's point of view, a lot of the, the, the heavier things that were promised uh, didn't materialize or were slow to materialize. And ultimately, they, they felt they had leverage because of, the, as we mentioned, the calendar. And so even if things were moving forward, they might not have been moving forward quickly enough. And uh, Hamas uh, arguably thought that it was a good time to remind people and maybe extract a few more concessions along the way. Okay, um, from Shira Goldman. With the Qatari cash for calm arrangement leaving Israel open to ongoing extortion, and given that Hamas's capabilities have become much more sophisticated, what would a cogent Gaza strategy look like at this point that does more than achieving periodic spells of quiet? Um, so, uh, you know, you addressed this a little bit already, but any, anything, anything kind of further to add on that? No, look, I'm not, uh, you know, I might have, uh, uh, sounded a bit critical towards uh, Israeli government policy and, and, and the current trajectory of things, but we also have to, to state this outright that Gaza is a very difficult policy problem. Uh, it, you know, in general, it has been for, for a decade now, we should say. You can't quite, uh, you can't quite cut a, a normal deal with Hamas, and yet you know, Israel obviously doesn't want to go in uh, you know, with tanks and, and reconquer the Gaza Strip with all that would entail, uh, loss of life on both sides, obviously, and then having to, to govern and run the Gaza Strip. Uh, so nobody quite wants to do either one of those kind of whole opposite uh, trajectories. So Netanyahu is trying to chart a middle course and to, and to kind of, uh, you know, get what he wants, which is pretty much quiet, right? Uh, so, you know, the, the fighting stopped and, and, and really, the only request from the Israeli side was, was uh, quiet, you know, in so many words. Uh, Hamas had a laundry list of, of demands. Uh, Israel just wants to stop to the rocket fire, uh, lessening of the friction on the border, stop to the incendiary balloons, uh, stop to the kind of nighttime, uh, nighttime terror activities on the, on the border, which make life very difficult for, for the Israeli residents down there. Um, but really, that's the only ask of, of Hamas, and Hamas is using that as, as the questioner mentioned to extort Israel. Uh, so really, uh, periodic bouts of, of quiet punctuated by these rounds of, of escalation, um, you know, hopefully we can do better to, to stabilize the situation, but, but there's really no quick fix to, to the Gaza problem. Okay, um, from Sharon Waldman, and uh, it's, a, it's a long question, so I'll, I'll paraphrase a bit, but um, you know, a little bit related to what you, just, what you, you were just talking about. Um, if humanitarian need is important, why is Israel withholding it? And is there, is there no way to ensure that Hamas does not rearm if that is the concern? Um, and if, we, if, we, if, if Israel does indeed give, give aid to Gaza, um, you know, what, will, what will Hamas do with it? Right. So uh, it should be mentioned that Israel does give a lot to, to Gaza to kind of keep Gaza afloat. Uh, whether it's uh, you know truckloads of goods that go in on, on a daily basis, whether it's uh, you know electricity lines, whether it's fuel that goes in, um, so there is a lot that Israel that Israel does. Obviously, Hamas and you know through them the Gazan people want want a lot more. Uh, but the question the question is is well well uh, well put, right? What will Hamas do with that increased uh, you know openness, that increased freedom, uh, and those increased resources? And that's really the, the crux of the problem. Uh, to give one example, you know, Israel allows uh, Gazans to enter, to enter Israel and receive medical treatment in Israeli hospitals. And uh, Israeli security forces have, have, have seen instances where Hamas has, has uh, used these medical permits and used the people who receive those medical permits to carry messages and to do other kind of terrorist, uh, you know, not operations, but, but you know, assistance efforts. Uh, that's number one, uh, you know, kind of forging, forging, uh, you know, cancer patients uh, to go in. Uh, you know, they use salt to, as part of the propulsion system for rockets. Uh, that's another example. So you're not going to outlaw salt, uh, but it's a huge problem. Uh, to say nothing with something like, like fertilizer. Uh, you know, as part of the ceasefire agreement, Hamas is asking for, for about a 30% reduction 
in, uh, in what Israel calls dual use items being imported into Gaza. So items that, that Israel and apparently the, the Shin Bet Security Service uh, deem could be used for military ends. Now, that's part of the ceasefire agreement. Whether Israel will agree to it or not is open to speculation. Whether Israel fulfills that file in the agreement is also very open uh, to speculation. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. You know, how much, how much are you willing to open Gaza up? Uh, and in return, how much are you willing to, to perhaps risk in terms of security? Michael? Uh, it looks like Michael may have froze for a bit. So I'll just, I'll take over. Um, uh, we have a question from Raymond uh, Hakimi. Uh, sorry, oh, Michael's back. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Don't want to take your job, uh, but go, go ahead, go yeah, ahead. Sorry about that, just close them. Uh, although you know what, Eli, now all the questions in my queue are gone. So I think you have to. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Barry Fleischman. Uh, is there any evidence Hamas is getting more sophisticated weaponry that can can successfully pierce the Iron Dome system? Right. So that's actually uh, a really good question, and that goes into um, you know why this round was a bit different than what we've seen before. Uh, there was one barrage yesterday afternoon that that really overwhelmed the Iron Dome system um, right around Ashkelon and, and kind of closer to the Gaza Strip um, in southern Israel. And so you saw these, these coordinated barrages of rockets uh, come in and, and a lot of them fell and they caused, uh, they caused ultimately a few, a few casualties on the Israeli side. Uh, they also, we know that they're manufacturing kind of shorter range rockets, but with heavier payloads. So when, when they do land, we've seen the shrapnel uh, injuries uh, become a lot worse. Uh, so that's another thing that, uh, that is fairly new. Um, in terms of the lethality of the weapons, but uh, but again, it, it speaks to the command and control that, that Hamas and the other factions have. Uh, they they direct their fire at a certain certain geographic location, and they 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 tried this time and succeeded uh, yesterday afternoon in in kind of almost overwhelming the Iron Dome. Uh, again, it's food for thought uh, in terms of any future round, and really in terms of uh, kind of a real a real military campaign between the sides. Okay, so I think Michael, Michael, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, but I still, uh, the, the, I still only have, I have one question in okay, my. So, yeah. Okay, so um, let me just get this last one that you can see. Just uh, Raymond Hakimi is asking about the influence of Iran uh, on Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So we covered that fairly well. Uh, you know. They, they do support the groups, uh, primarily Islamic Jihad, and they have since Islamic Jihad was, was founded. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's determinative, we'll put it that way. Uh, I don't think these groups are, are direct Iranian proxies where they get a phone call from Tehran and, and they escalate. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, very good reasons uh, inside Gaza and, and people thinking about strategy inside Gaza, and they're, they're finally calibrating how they go about things, uh, primarily over the past year, and you know, it has to be said, they they have extracted concessions from from the Netanyahu government, and so I don't think they're just kind of you know dancing to to the Iranian fiddle, uh, despite the fact that that you know we see this narrative come up uh, sometimes. So you know, it's it's to be taken with a grain of salt, I would say, despite the fact that Iran you know does support them, uh, that is true. All right. Um, I, I see one in here that I'll ask, and then I think we'll uh, and we'll close. Um, so Barry Fleischman, uh, is there any evidence Hamas is getting more sophisticated weaponry? weaponry that's, the, that's the question. That's the question I asked when you oh, were all right. <laughs> you uh, off last right. All right. Um, so in uh, in that case, um, I think uh, I, I think Nariel, I'll, I'll quickly ask you one one last question, unless I missed this one, <laughs> unless I missed this one too, which is. Um, you know, at some point in the next month or two months, we may see some sort of peace initiative from the Trump administration. Do you, if, if we actually see one, do you expect that it will alter this dynamic between Israel and Gaza in any way, or it's just going to be kind of a, a blip on the screen? Uh, I don't believe, from everything I know, I don't believe the, the deal of the century will, will deal with Gaza all that much. 
Um, and even if it does, it'll be, I think, more hypotheticals because the crux of the, of the strategic and political problem uh, with Gaza will remain intact. I don't think uh, the Americans have a real role in, in kind of trying to solve that. And this isn't, this isn't uh, a slam against the Trump administration. This was true under Obama as well. Uh, these are kind of deep-rooted strategic problems that Israel has been grappling with uh, for, for over a decade from Gaza. Uh, having said that, I would, I would caution uh, the Trump team in, in kind of re-emphasizing what we talked about earlier, which is that violence pays and diplomacy and nonviolence uh, not only does not pay, but actually gets you, gets you the reverse, gets you, uh, gets you nothing in return. Um, so I would, I would caution them on, on kind of reaffirming this, this narrative, which we see develop on the Palestinian side, uh, where, where the PA, which, uh, you know, Michael, I know you know this uh, as well as I do, on a daily basis, uh, cooperate with the Israel, Israeli army, with the Israeli intelligence uh, arms, on a daily basis to uphold stability in the West Bank. Now you compare that to, to Hamas and Islamic Jihad, who, who just fired 700 rockets onto Israeli civilians. And uh, not only is there, you know, they got, they got hammered uh, militarily over the past two days, but ultimately uh, the ceasefire deal was reaffirmed. It'll likely be implemented somewhat in the coming week. Uh, so I would, I would urge, I would urge the, the US government to kind of take that into account when they put forward their plan hopefully not, uh, not re-emphasize that, that kind of corrosive and negative narrative among, among Palestinians, that diplomacy and nonviolence uh, do not pay. Hopefully it does pay off. All right, um, so uh, before we close, I just want to uh, urge everyone to, to follow, follow Neri on, on Twitter for more of his insights. Uh, your handle is, is, is at Neri Zilber, right? Off the top of my head. Yeah, uh, at, at Neri Zilber. Um, uh, if you would like to, if you haven't already, if you would like to uh, read the Dina Ask Brookings Task Force report that, uh, that Neri referenced earlier, you can find that on israelpolicyforum.org. Um, we ourselves are going to have uh, more coming on Gaza this week, including a podcast with our Israel fellow Nimrod Novik. And so I would urge you all to uh, keep on, keep on uh, checking out israelpolicyforum.org for a whole uh, wealth of resources that we will be posting. And Neri, uh, really thank you so much for, for joining us today and, uh, and doing a, a, a fabulous job, as always, of, of explaining everything. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and uh, have enjoy the rest of your uh, afternoons, uh, evenings, or mornings, depending on where you are. Thank you.